Constitution Center's online uh, courses, the classes, excuse me. Uh, I am so excited to be talking about the 27 amendments today. We're going to do it in just under, just over 27 minutes. Um, and uh, I am Jenna. I am substitute moderating today for Curry Sautner, but I am here with Tom Donnelly, who is our uh, chief content officer. Hi, Tom. Hey, Jenna. Great to see everyone. This is a fantastic topic today, so I'm so happy that you're all joining us. What we're doing is in the chat, we're answering two questions. Um, what is the amendment you most like to learn about? Hopefully we'll be able to focus, uh, we're gonna get to all of them, but we'll hopefully we'll be able to focus on those amendments that you're telling us, right? A lot of people have uh, brought up some of the Bill of Rights amendments, two, four, six uh, have been uh, big topics uh, so that have been mentioned so far. And also what would your proposal be for a 28th amendment? We'll talk about that at the end of the class. But to kick things off, um, so continue to put those in the chat. And to, to kick things off, I wanna um, bring up some of the big questions that we're gonna dive into today. So how have constitutional amendments really transformed the constitution? Which constitutional rights and principles did the American people write into the Constitution through the Article V amendment process? And what changes did various constitutional amendments make to the structural Constitution? So that's that um, separation of powers, branches of government um, Constitution that we see in those articles. Tom, any other big ideas that um, and big takeaways that you want people to uh, focus on while we're going through these uh, amendments today? Yeah, I think one of the most powerful things about Article 5 and the amendment process is that it's a reminder that the founding generation didn't think it had monopoly on constitutional wisdom. They themselves learned from their lived experiences and from history, and they expected us to do the same over time and use this process to develop ideas that can get the broad support of the American people and ultimately make the Constitution better. Yeah, so it wasn't that they didn't think that they had done a good job with the Constitution. It was that they knew that future generations like us would have to put our own mark on it and make it work for our lives, right? Exactly. Okay, so let's look at that process that they built into the Constitution itself. Um, so five minutes on Article 5, not even five minutes. <laughs> How do we amend the Constitution? Sure. So the amendment process, again, it's written in Article 5 of the Constitution. There are two big steps when it comes to approving a new amendment. First is the formal proposal stage, which to get an amendment proposed, you have to either be able to get support from two thirds of the members of Congress in each house. So you have to get two thirds in the House of Representatives, two thirds in the Senate. Alternatively, you can turn to the states. So if Congress is blocking your way and you still think your idea is a good one, you can go to the state legislatures. And if two thirds of the legislatures of the states agree with you, then the, the state legislatures can then force Congress to call a convention for proposing new amendments. So those are the two paths through Congress or through the states. Both require supermajority support, two thirds support, but that's only the first part of the process. Even if you get through that part of the process, you then move to ratification because those proposed amendments are then sent to the states for the American people to say yes or no. There are two different mechanisms here for ratification. One is going through state legislatures, or two is to go through specially called state ratifying conventions. In either case, you have to be able to secure support of three fourths of the states. If we're looking at the amendments as a whole, we have 27 that have been ratified over time. Every single one of our ratified amendments have been approved by Congress. So they've gone through that first route of proposal. And when it comes to ratification, all but one were ratified through state legislatures. Only one went through specially called state ratifying conventions. That was the 21st Amendment, which got rid of the Prohibition Amendment. And Congress decides which of those methods that will uh, it will take to ratify the, the amendment. We don't get to decide that, right? Correct. It's Congress makes the decision on how ratification is going to be, whether it's state legislatures or conventions. I like that we have those two options of like, you know, if if Congress or if the state legislatures aren't making it happen, that we like have that power as the people. And I like that the the founding fathers uh, gave that to us. Absolutely, and it came up when they were discussing Article 5 at the convention, that was part of the concern. They didn't want reform to get bottled up in Congress or just to rely on one institution. So they wanted to give us some different options. Fantastic. All right, so 27 amendments, um, that's a lot to get through, but we think that it's a little easier to process if we break them up into time periods because we've kind of gone through uh, peaks and valleys when it comes to amending the constitution. So Tom, tell us a little bit about these time periods and why we chunked them this way. Yeah, so there are four different periods here. So we can see amendments really come in waves for the most part. 
So the first period is the founding period from 1791 to 1804. It gives us the first 12 amendments to the Constitution, including the Bill of Rights. Then we have a 60 year gap until the next set of amendments during Reconstruction, that period after the Civil War, 1865, 1870, where we ratified the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment that many scholars refer to as our nation's second founding. Then we have another 40 year gap until the Progressive Era and the next set of four amendments ratified from 1913 to 1920, so a seven year period, we get four new amendments, the 16th through the 19th. And then finally, in this sort of modern period from 1933 to 1992, we see the remaining eight amendments little by little ratified between 1933 and 1992, which means it's been almost 30 years since the last time we've amended the constitution. Yeah, we're in kind of one of those those drier periods now, but who knows, maybe another burst is coming up. <laughs> Um, and I also like that you say sort of modern because we're going to get into that story at the end, which is one of my favorites. But um, let's start with that first um, uh, kind of generation, which is those that founding period. Now, they just wrote the Constitution. You would think that it would like have a little bit of staying power before they started uh, taking a red pen and editing it. So why why do we have so many amendments right off the bat? Yeah, it's kind of an extraordinary thing. One of the first things the first Congress does is revise the Constitution that was just <laughs> ratified. You know, part of this is it's arising from the debates over the ratification of the Constitution. So the debates between the Federalists who supported the Constitution, the Anti-Federalists who opposed it. One of the Anti-Federalists' biggest objections was, you're creating this new national government that's distant, that could be very powerful. Where is the Bill of Rights? How can you not include a Bill of Rights in this new constitution? And so in the first Congress, James Madison sitting there in the US House of Representatives, he was initially skeptical of the need for a Bill of Rights, but he wanted to keep faith with the concerns that the Anti-Federalists expressed. And so he would take on the, 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 uh, the project of being the primary drafter of the Bill of Rights, and he would shepherd it through Congress. And so again, the Bill of Rights ends up being, it's a response to the criticisms offered by the Anti-Federalists during ratification. Yeah, so it was almost like the ratification was a little bit conditional on we we like this document, but we need a couple changes. And so that's kind of their Bill of Rights was a um, response to that. Yeah, in certain key states, Virginia, Massachusetts, New York, it was really, really close ratification. We could have said no. And part of the compromise that was reached between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists was the Federalists said, once this thing's ratified, we'll work to pass some amendments that assuage some of your fears. Got it. All right, so let's get into those. Um, and again, like the 27 amendments, we can also break the Bill of Rights into categories. Um, so tell us a little bit about each one of these categories and then we'll get into it because we got to get, <laughs> get through these really fast. Absolutely, so these are the different bundles of amendments. We get these ideas from our friend Akhil Amar, a professor at Yale Law School. And I think they're a key way for us to just wrap our heads around some of the big themes we'll find in the amendments. So should we begin with First Amendment? Yeah, let's go, freedom of conscience. Yeah, so the First Amendment is its own bundle of rights. There are five freedoms in the Bill of Rights, freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, petition. All of them go to this big idea of the freedom of conscience. When it comes to protections for religion, in the First Amendment, we see religious liberty protected in two different ways, guards against the government establishment of religion, and it protects the free exercise of religion. So again, this goes to the core of our freedom of conscience, the right to freely believe or not as we wish. wish. Those next two freedoms, speech and press, are obviously so important to a functioning republic. And so what we see here is that, generally speaking, the government can't punish you for what you speak, right, for what you say. And the Supreme Court over time has read really robust, strong protections for free speech and a free press into the First Amendment. Generally speaking, the government can't punish your speech unless it's likely to and directed at causing immediate lawless action. So we protect the, the Supreme Court protects free speech and press more strongly than at any point in our history. And the United States protects these rights more robustly than anywhere else in the world. And then finally, the last two freedoms we see here, assembly and petition, we may not think about them a lot, but they've been very important throughout American history, especially for those that don't have a formal political voice through the vote. And so especially in the 19th century and the 1800s, the right to assemble and petition were really important for groups like women, African-Americans, people that didn't have a voice at the ballot box, they could still powerfully state political and constitutional message through assembling, through petitioning. And frankly, it really, these rights helped reshape American history and the very constitution itself. 
Yeah, I love that they're not just rights, but they're tools. These are, um, you know, you you can be who you are and believe what you want and say those things, express yourself, but then also fight for what you believe in and have those tools to, to put that into the Constitution if you believe in it that strongly. It's a really amazing amendment. And we are going to spend way more time on the First Amendment. I promise we have those uh, classes coming up in February. So uh, come back and join us while we really dive into the First Amendment. In the meantime, we are going to move on to those military amendments. So two and three. Yeah. So beginning with the Second Amendment here, the Second Amendment ends up going for the founding generation to concerns about professional armies. And so in part for the founding generation, the Second Amendment expressed the founding generation's commitment to the value of rooting the communities and nation safety in a well-regulated citizen-led, citizen-filled militia. But also the second amendment is consistent with the Supreme Court's recent decisions in Heller, McDonald, and Bruin saying that the second amendment also grants an individual right to keep and bear arms. So the second amendment, that's the second amendment, still one of the most debated amendments in America today. Um, and one that was very important to the founding generation. The third amendment, on the other hand, we may not think about very much. But it ends up protecting us against the need to house soldiers in times of peace. Now, this may seem like a weird thing to have in the Bill of Rights, but it grew out of the founding generation's own lived experience. The American colonists were faced with this challenge by the British Empire through the, the Quartering Act of, eight, of 1774. And so this Third Amendment was basically put in place to protect the sanctity of the home against similar abuses once we created a new government. Yeah, really happy that we have that. Um, I know it's, we don't talk about it a lot, but I think we would notice it if it wasn't there. Um, all right. And so kind of getting into some of those privacy and home, um, let's talk about the Fourth and Fifth Amendment. Yeah, so these two amendments go to concerns about privacy, property rights. The Fourth Amendment largely uh, governs our interactions today with police officers. And so if we look at the text of the amendment, it really tells us what does it protect, what sort of things are protected, persons, so our, our bodies our houses, our papers, and our effects. Our effects just mean our stuff. And what is the Fourth Amendment protecting those things against? Unreasonable searches and seizures by government officials. So again, like police officers today, the bottom line is that before the government can search your home, seize your property, seize your person, it needs a good reason. This is the big idea that's behind the, requ the warrant requirement that you find in the Fourth Amendment. So that's the Fourth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment then says something about property rights. And this is the takings clause that you find at the end of that big block of text, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. This speaks to the founding generation's concerns about property rights. And basically all it says is if the government wants to take your property, it has to be for a public use and they have to pay you a fair price for it. Seems fair. Uh, okay, so Fifth Amendment kind of segues us into the next grouping, which is about, you know, kind of the fair process, jury rights, rights of the accused. So a lot of, uh, you know, interaction with the courts here. Absolutely. And this is a reminder that things like fair process, the rights of criminal defendants, things like that were really, really important to the founding generation. We see four amendments touching on these concerns about process. Beginning with the Fifth Amendment, we see a couple of really big protections in there. The rest of that Fifth Amendment's text. One, it grants, uh, grants rights to criminal defendants against self-incrimination. So when you hear people get testifying, they say, I plead the fifth. Or when you hear you have the right to remain silent, they're talking about the Fifth Amendment and the right against self-incrimination. We also see in the Fifth Amendment the, the due process clause near the end where it says, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This speaks to a, a fair process. The government has to have a fair process in place before it can deny anyone of their life, their liberty, or their property. It goes to a bigger concern really about the rule of law. And so that being a key feature of the Fifth Amendment. Moving to the Sixth Amendment, we see it grant even more rights to criminal defendants, the right to a jury trial in criminal cases, the right to counsel, so a right to a lawyer, uh, the right to be informed of the government's charges against you, the right to confront the witnesses that are going to be testifying against you. All of these key rights, again, that we find in the Fifth Amendment and Sixth Amendment going to a fair process for those, in this case, that are accused of a crime. The Seventh Amendment then further strengthens our jury rights. And what it says is, sure, the Sixth Amendment says a right to a jury trial in a criminal case. The Seventh Amendment says you also have a right to a jury trial in civil cases. So these are non-criminal cases, often involving money or property in a certain way. Certain way. This was an important concern of the Anti-Federalists, and so the founding generation wrote it into the Seventh Amendment. And then finally, the Eighth Amendment 
uh, deals with a right against cruel and unusual punishment, excessive bail, excessive fines. At the Supreme Court, this is the amendment, the Eighth Amendment, that often involves the death penalty. Those cases fall under the Eighth Amendment. And this reflected the anti-federalist concerns, people like Patrick Henry, who were concerned that this new national government was going to invent new unusual crimes, have really awful punishments to try to punish political dissenters. The Eighth Amendment there was there to protect against those dangers. All right. So a big, really important chunk of um, amendments dealing with the criminal justice system that were really important to those uh, to the founders um, to, to help protect citizens. Um, OK, so the final one, popular sovereignty amendments, that's nine and ten. So I think the first question is, what is popular sovereignty, Tom? And then what do these amendments do to protect it? Yeah, so the popular sovereignty is the big idea. If you think of the preamble. We, the people, it's the idea that all authority of government, the legitimate source of power in our government derives from the American people. And so the Ninth Amendment here, many scholars interpret it as writing a protection of certain natural rights into the Constitution. So James Madison, one of his concerns about having a Bill of Rights was that one, we weren't going to be able to list all of the rights that people have, that our rights are so numerous that we can't possibly set them all down in writing. The other being that even once we set those rights down in writing, we can't write them in as broad and capacious a way as they actually exist. And so the Ninth Amendment is telling us just because a certain thing is written in the Bill of Rights and written a certain way in the Bill of Rights doesn't mean that those are the only rights that we have. So it's a recognition of the broad rights of the people. And then finally, the 10th Amendment really has to do about uh, do with the founding generation's commitment to federalism, the division of power between the national government and the states. It recognizes that although we're creating a new national government, the states are going to still reserve a large amount of power and a large role in our constitutional system. All right, fantastic. So that's the Bill of Rights. And I that was a lot of those Bill of Rights amendments are the ones that you told me that you want to learn about. So um, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, um, and especially the First Amendment, we have classes on all of those coming up. So if you like learning about those amendments, definitely tune in to those classes later in the year. But we're going to finish out that founding period with 11 and 12. Um, tell me about uh, these amendments and what, what they did to the Constitution. Well, the 11th Amendment is ratified four years after the Bill of Rights in 1795. It's a response to a Supreme Court decision, Chisholm versus Georgia. And so what the Supreme, basically what this amendment says is, Supreme Court, you were wrong. So this is an example of an amendment that's correcting the Supreme Court. What it basically says is that ordinary citizens can't haul states into national courts. That's all the 11th Amendment is saying. But the important thing is it's saying, Supreme Court, you are wrong. We, the people, have a better answer. Right, uh, which I think is really important. It's getting into some of the questions that I'm going to save till the end. But yes, yeah, so, the um, amendments kind of addressing court decisions that some of our uh, the attendees might not agree with, looks like, uh, are some of the proposals. Um, but I do want to talk about the 12th Amendment because this is a result of a couple of uh, uh, some, some messy. Uh, we think we have messy elections now, but there was, a, a, you know, it was from the beginning, we've had some controversial elections. So tell us about the 12th Amendment. So the 12th Amendment is ratified in 1804. It arises out of problems we had with the presidential elections of 1796 and 1800. Under the original Constitution, electors in the Electoral College had two votes for president. And so in 1796, and then that whoever received a majority in the Electoral College and the most votes would become president. And the second place winner, the second place person in second place would become vice president. So in 1796, we see John Adams square off against Thomas Jefferson. John Adams wins in 1796. But uh, and, and at this point in time, there's actually the development of two political parties already happening. The, the framers didn't necessarily envision this, but we already see John Adams associated with the Federalists, Thomas Jefferson with the Democratic Republicans. And what happens in 1796 is Adams finishes in first place, but none of the Federalists finish in second place. Thomas Jefferson did. And so John Adams becomes president. His vice president is his opponent from the presidential election, Thomas Jefferson. So imagine Hillary Clinton as Donald Trump's vice president or Donald Trump as Joe Biden's vice president. This didn't work terribly well. And then we get have an even bigger problem arise in the election of 1800. It's a rematch between Adams and Jefferson. This time Jefferson wins, but he ties with his running mate, Aaron Burr. And rather than stepping aside, because everyone knew Jefferson was at the top of the ticket, Burr said, hey, I got the electoral votes to win this thing. With a tie in the electoral votes, it then went to the U.S. House of Representatives to decide the president. The U.S. House is controlled by the opposing party, the Federalists, and Byrd tries to drum up enough support to seize the presidency. 
Ultimately, the House would select Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson would become president. But we decided we need to change the Electoral College to avoid some of these issues. And so in the end, what we did with the 12th Amendment was we still gave electors two votes, but they'd have one vote for president and one specific vote for vice president. I think that's so interesting seeing amendments coming up as responses to, like you said, court decisions or um, events in history that where the Constitution came into play and it kind of caused some some issues where we're, we see the American people kind of amending the Constitution in response to those. And I think we're going to see that a lot later on as we get into some of this 20th century amendments. For sure. Um, okay, but before we get there, let's talk about Reconstruction and that second founding because it's so uh, such an important time um, and really transformative um, in our nation's history. For sure. So we're fast forwarding 60 years. It's after the Civil War. We ratify a series of three transformational amendments. Many scholars refer to them as our nation's second founding. And so these amendments are the 13th Amendment ratified in 1865, which abolishes slavery. The 14th Amendment, which is ratified in 1868, which wrote the Declaration of Independence's promise of freedom and equality into the Constitution. The 15th Amendment ratified in 1870, promising to end racial discrimination and voting. These amendments transformed the Constitution, its very text, forever. I mean, as a reminder, think about where the Constitution was before these amendments. Of course, it didn't mention the word slavery, but there are key protections written into the original Constitution that increased the political power of the slaveholding states. The Constitution was silent on the Declaration of Independence's promise of equality and furthermore on African-American voting rights. Uh, the Bill of Rights only applied to the national government, not to state abuses. And finally, things like citizenship were left to the states and the courts with Chief Justice Roger Brooktani and the infamous Dred Scott decision saying that African-Americans can't be United States citizens and they had, quote, no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. Now, after these amendments, we see our Constitution abolishing slavery, the 13th Amendment. It made everyone born on American soil a U.S. citizen. That's the 14th Amendment. It promised equal protection of the laws for everyone. Again, that's the 14th Amendment. It protected us from state abuses of key Bill of Rights protections like free speech and religious liberty. That's the 14th Amendment again. It guaranteed the right to vote free of racial discrimination. That's the 15th Amendment. And finally, it gave the national government new power to enforce the protections in all three amendments. That's the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. It really is a second founding, and we like to highlight kind of our second founders. So it just as important as it is to talk about Ben Franklin, George Washington, Madison, Adams, Jefferson. We also want to talk about the people that contributed to those Reconstruction Amendments and kind of gave us that that second founding because it's uh, um, such an important story to, to to tell and learn about. For sure. Um, all right. So moving on to the progressive era. So 16 through 19, a couple like really, uh, really big amendments, uh, lots of constitutional change during this uh, this time period. So uh, let's dive into those starting with 16. Absolutely. We're fast forwarding 40 years. It's now the 16th Amendment ratified in 1913. It grants Congress the power to pass an income tax. This is another amendment that arises from movements saying the Supreme Court's wrong. The Supreme Court in the Pollock decision said Congress didn't have the power to pass an income tax. Movements among populists and progressives said, no, 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 Supreme Court, you're wrong. And finally, in 1913, those reformers won and Congress was granted the power to pass an income tax and Congress did it. All right. And what about the 17th Amendment? Tell us about that one. Sure, the 17th Amendment, also ratified in 1913, that's two amendments in 1913 alone, provided for the popular election of senators. So under the original constitution, the election of senators was left to the state legislatures, and the 17th Amendment then gives that power to us, the American people. So it's the 17th Amendment that gives us the U.S. Senate elections that we have today. Great. Now, the 18th Amendment is a biggie. So let's uh, talk about that story, because there's a lot in that went into ratifying this amendment and then a lot that happened after we ratified it. Absolutely. So we'll take the 18th Amendment and flash forward ahead to the 21st right. and we'll take them in turn. The 18th Amendment is the Prohibition Amendment. So this is the amendment that banned the manufacture, sale or transportation of intoxicating liquors. It's the only amendment that we've repealed in whole in a later amendment. And so in many ways, it reminds us that sometimes the American people conclude certain constitutional reforms, they don't work. And so the 18th Amendment, it grows out of a really long period of time of social movement activism. There is a real problem to address. Americans drank a lot of alcohol and it led to a lot of societal problems. So we decide through you know, the, the amendment process to ban, to, to, to pursue national prohibition. That's the 18th Amendment. 
But a mere 13 years later, we decide to repeal that amendment. And through the 21st Amendment, again, it's the only amendment that totally repeals, uh, is totally repealed by another amendment. The 21st Amendment reads the 18th article of amendment to the Constitution of the United States is hereby repealed. Section one's really, really <laughs> correct in what it's doing. And why are we repealing it? Well, it's really two big things. One is that Americans just wanted ready access to beer, wine, liquor, and they were willing to take on some of the societal trouble that could arise from that. The other, though, is that prohibition was really, really hard to enforce. Mm -hmm. And so we see widespread flouting of the law, law enforcement not really able to enforce it, the rise of organized crime. And there was a broader sense that prohibition may be contributing to undermining the rule of law in the nation and overall respect for the Constitution. And so we decided that prohibition had to go. So, but prohibition, I know a lot of people look at it as a, a hiccup, a mistake, but there were reasons for it. And it did help reduce the amount that we were drinking, right? Oh, yes. No, I mean, like, again, huge societal ills, people drinking away their weekly wage at the saloon, violence in the home. There were real problems, which is why a range of social movements got behind prohibition. You're right, Jenna. By the time we're repealing the, uh, the prohibition amendment in, the, in, in 1933, we did see a reduction in alcohol use in America. So it did change social mores. So it, it didn't completely fail. But like you said, there were issues um, that arose that made it not a complete success either. All right. So we didn't, we certainly didn't mean to skip any amendments. So we're going to go back because this is also a very important amendment with an incredible story. So let's, let's talk about the 19th Amendment. Sure. So the 19th Amendment, it's ratified in 1920. It protects the right to vote free of sex discrimination. So again, the original constitution leaves voting largely to the states. We see over time, though, the American people use the amendment process to expand voting rights. We saw this with the 15th Amendment as to race. And with the 19th Amendment, we see with it as to women's suffrage. And so this is a pretty amazing story because it begins with state experimentation. So we see women gain the right to vote first out west. And then this experiment works so well, it's gradually over the decades expands to the east until it's adopted by big states like New York and Michigan. And finally, we all determined that this experiment worked so well that we wanted to write it into our constitution. That's how we got the 19th Amendment. It's really a story of federalism. A reminder that, as Justice Louis Brandeis said, the states can be laboratories of democracy and we can learn from state experiments and create great rules that can then apply to the entire nation. I really love that idea that like, you know, why we have that federalism and that, um, you know, there were states where women were voting before 1920. It's not that uh, the, the 19th Amendment didn't give everybody the right to vote. Some people already had the right to vote. Um, and we also know that the um, there were other laws um, uh, that were preventing some women to, from voting even after the 19th Amendment, particularly women of color. We'll get into some of those amendments a little bit later, too, as we um, go into the uh, modern era. So 1933 to 1992. So tell us about this group of amendments. Sure. So again, these are amendments little by little. We're adding these last eight amendments to the Constitution, beginning with the 20th Amendment. So the 20th Amendment, it's ratified in 1933. And basically what it does is it reduces the length of time between an election and when a new Congress and president take office. Basically what it does, it shifts that date from up from March to January. Very simple. Yeah, if, if, so January, if November to January still feels like a long time to me, but I can't imagine waiting till March. Okay, so we already did the 20, um, 21st Amendment, so, and we are at time, but hopefully everybody will be able to stick in. We're going to uh, be just a couple more minutes, so hang in there with us. Uh, 22nd Amendment. The 22nd Amendment limited the president to two terms in office. And so it's a reminder that the original president was set by George Washington. He ran for office, won, ran for re-election, won, and then retired voluntarily to Mount Vernon. Every other president would follow Washington's example until FDR. FDR is elected four different times. And afterwards, the American people said, no, we liked it the way Washington did it better. So we wrote that requirement. We wrote that Washington precedent into the Constitution with the 22nd Amendment, limiting the president to two terms. And what about the 23rd Amendment? What does this one do? So the 23rd Amendment is ratified in 1961. This is during the Civil Rights era. And the 23rd Amendment grants Washington, D.C. three electoral votes, adding the voice of D.C. voters to presidential elections. Now, this is significant in part because Washington, D.C. has a massive African-American population, and so it gives them a voice in presidential elections. And that's um, really kind of coming out of the Civil Rights Movement, which is true about a couple amendments that we're talking about during this time period. Um, so what about the 24th Amendment? Let's look at that one. 
So the 24th Amendment bans poll taxes in national elections. Poll taxes were state laws that were part of these Jim Crow laws keeping African Americans from voting. When we ratified the 24th Amendment, five states still had poll taxes in place, Mississippi, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Alabama. The 24th Amendment banned poll taxes in national elections. And then two years later, the Supreme Court said, oh yeah, they don't work in state or local elections either. So I love that the civil rights movement, it was um, obviously everyone knows the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, but we were also working to amend the Constitution to uh, to broaden these rights for, for all Americans. It's a really amazing movement. Um, okay, 25th Amendment and presidential succession. Fans of the West Wing will know this one. <laughs> exactly. 25th Amendment ratified in 1967 uh, deals with pre issues of presidential succession and incapacity. In part, this is growing out of concerns from JFK's assassination in November 1963. It deals with a few problems, a few issues. One, Section 1, deals with, uh, basically says that, you know, if a president dies, resigns, or is removed from office, the vice president becomes president. Section 2 deals with the issue if we have a vacancy in the vice presidency, how do we fill it? The president would nominate someone, and then both houses of Congress have to approve of that person. Section three permits the president to temporarily transfer power by written statement. This is, for instance, if a president goes under anesthesia for a surgery, the president can sign a document, the vice president becomes president in, the, you know, in, in, in that period, and then signs it back and the power goes back to the president. So it's a very simple workaround for that circumstance. And then finally, Article four addresses a situation where a president refuses to transfer his duties while others in government conclude that he's unable to fulfill, the, fulfill, fulfill them. So this is a temporary way for dealing with presidential incapacity. Um, it's other members of the government temporarily removing the president from office until that capacity returns. So it seems like it's, it gets into a lot of kind of those nitty gritty details, which the overall constitution doesn't really do. It's the constitution focuses on broad strokes, but you know, for this, it's so important to know who has that presidential power that they really had to put it into the constitution. Exactly. Okay. Uh, we're almost there, people. The 26th amendment, I love this one because it's the fastest amendment to get ratified, right? That's right, 26th Amendment ratified in 1971, under four months to get it ratified. So it's a really, really compressed ratification process. Effectively, what the 26th Amendment does is it sets the national voting age at 18 years old. And so prior to this amendment, most states had the voting age at 21 years old. But, you know, if you think of the context, 1971, it's during the Vietnam War. And so many people are shipping off to Vietnam, risking their lives for their country, and they're under the age of 21, so they could be shipped away to give up their lives for the country, but they can't even vote on their leaders. And so the American people concluded that this was wrong. And with the 26th Amendment, we set that national voting age, we reduce it to 18 years old. All right, and finally, we made it to the 27th Amendment, which has probably the most interesting story. Who wrote this amendment, Tom? <laughs> sure, so the 27th Amendment ratified in 1992, but written by James Madison. That's amazing, 1992. So, so yeah, so the, the difference between framing and ratification, it's over two centuries. And so this amendment, this language was actually written by James Madison and, and approved by Congress and sent to the states as part of the package that became the Bill of Rights. And so at the time, what does this amendment do? It prevents members of Congress from raising their own salaries until there's been a new election. And so this is one where con the first Congress approved of this amendment, sent it to the states for ratification, but only six, state rat six states ratified. So that wasn't enough to make it part of the constitution. So it just sort of hung out there. No one really thought much about it for decades upon decades, for centuries, until finally in 1982, we have a sophomore at the University of Texas. And he's, he, has a, he has a paper assignment, his name's Gregory Watson. He has to write about some aspect of the government process. He finds a book that lists all of these amendments that had failed. And he sees this amendment and he says, hey, I think this one's a pretty good idea. Furthermore, there's no time limit on ratification, so I think we can still ratify it. So he writes a paper making this argument. He does very poorly on this paper. His professor and TA think it's a lousy paper. They give him a C. He says, no, 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 that's baloney. This paper is, this idea is good. This amendment's good. I'm going to prove to them what a good idea this is. I'm going to actually get this amendment ratified. And so the student, Gregory Watson, writes letters to politicians all around the country. He's mostly ignored, except there's one powerful politician that sees this idea, sees this amendment and says, it's a great idea. And so this is, this is a, a Senator Bill Cohen of Maine. So he pushes for ratification of this amendment in Maine. Maine ratifies the amendment. 
Then it picks up in other states. Other states take notice. Other states ratify it. In part, this amendment dovetails with broader concerns and disapproval about Congress at that time. Until finally, in 1992, over two centuries after the first cent uh, after the first Congress proposes the amendment, the the the, the three fourths of the states ratify it. It becomes the 27th Amendment to the Constitution. Again, framed by James Madison, pushed to the finish line by disgruntled student Gregory Watson uh, in, in 1992. Who later got his A. I love that he went back to his university and said, <laughs> yeah. you need to change my grade, even after he exactly. had graduated. That's, <laughs> that, that's holding on. <laughs> All right. So thank you, Tom. That was an amazing journey. Um, we did ask everybody at the beginning of class, and so I'm going to stop sharing um, so I can look at the chat. We did ask everybody at the beginning of class what their 28th Amendment would be. And then we also have some questions, but I do want to highlight some 28th Amendments because uh, they're really interesting. Um, one, uh, limiting amounts um, of po political contributions. Like I said, that that would almost be a reaction to um, uh, some Supreme Court decisions like Citizens United kind of getting into that, um, you know, saying, Supreme Court, you're wrong, if, if we were to amend that, uh, to include that constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, let's see. I don't want to miss any other, oh, uh, nonpartisan gerrymandering. So that's another proposal in there. Um, so uh, really interesting one say maximum age for president. So we uh, we have a minimum age for president, but could we have a maximum age? That one just came in. Um, but we also have some questions about kind of amendments. Are there any amendments that are currently outstanding, like that are um, you know, currently on the docket? I don't think there are, right? Um, I mean, there were, there, I'm trying to think, there are a certain number of amendments that have passed Congress, but were never ratified. I think there's like six or seven of them, but none of them are really being lively, you know, debated uh, very much today, other than debates over the ERA, where and there's some debate over whether the, whether there's enough states to have already rat ratified the ERA at all. And there are a range of constitutional questions around that, that scholars debate and that courts have never decisively decided. One of them being the ERA in its last iteration by Congress had a deadline of 1982. And the question is, does that bind the Article 5 amendment process? The other one is this question of what states ratify an amendment, can they also withdraw their ratification or are they sort of stuck in that process having already ratified? And so some of these details have to be ironed out to determine the fate of the ERA. But that's the one that's like most alive, I would say. There's also some, uh, you know, some political activity and has been over time trying to get the state legislatures to call a new convention for proposing amendments. And this arises out of different uh, different ideas. One of them being, for instance, a balanced budget amendment. I know that there's been, over time been a push to try to get Congress to call a convention to propose something like that. So there's always some activity also at the state level around that as well. I've seen a lot of chatter about flying Bernie amendments too. Uh, I suppose just like Gregory Watson got that original second amendment, the uh, that original first amendment uh, probably doesn't have a time limit on it either, but I doubt that one get, would get passed because it sets um, a proportional number of Congress people to uh, equal to population. And so it would be something like thousands and thousands of members of Congress now. So yeah, it would greatly enlarge the U.S. House of Representatives. <laughs> for, for practicality's sake, I don't think that one's probably likely to get passed. Um, suggestions, president cannot declare war. All regions owned by the United States um, are states, not territories. So D.C. and Puerto Rico, um, among others. Uh, term limits for Supreme Court, term limits for Congress, lots of these suggestions that we've, um, we've see, we see these a lot. And these are also ones that do get brought up in the news a lot. For sure, term limits are a perennial, uh, per perennial source of debate. And they tend to be, if you look in uh, public opinion polls, you know, they are, they, they, it is a proposal that can sometimes get support from both parties, which, you know, when you're looking at constitutional amendments, the, the founding generation intentionally made the process really, really hard. And so the ideas that you're going to get ratified often need really, really broad political support. And these days you would say it probably would need bipartisan support. Yeah. Um, and before we go, I know we we're running out of time, um, but I did want to address one question that came up in the chat about um, the uh Sixth Amendment, Gideon versus Wainwright, why did it take till the 60s for um, you know, that to be um, applied to the states? And so could you touch on incorporation really quickly? 
and kind of that gradual appropriation. Yeah, absolutely. So the original Bill of Rights, again, it only applies to the national government. It's only through the 14th Amendment and later decisions by the Supreme Court that the Bill of Rights then applies to the state and local governments. This is a process known as incorporation. Um, it's one of the most important things that's ever happened in American constitutional law. So many of the cases that you would think of today as Bill of Rights cases, fuel falling under the amendments one through 10 are actually 14th Amendment cases that we only reach because of the 14th Amendment. Gideon versus Wainwright's an example. The only reason we can, that, that Gideon has a claim under the US Constitution is because of the 14th Amendment and incorporation because you're dealing with Florida state law there. And so why does it take so long for the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel to be incorporated? The answer is that it just took a really long time for incorporation as a whole to ever take hold. There were early decisions after, the, right after the ratification of the 14th Amendment, which undermined incorporation and read the 14th Amendment narrowly. It was only until really in 1925 where the Supreme Court in earnest began to incorporate new rights. That was in a case called uh, Gitlow which incorporated the First Amendment's free speech and the free speech protections. And it wound up being a gradual process, case by case, where the Supreme Court would incorporate one right after another. We see this process really pick up once we get the Warren Court, which emerges in the 1950s and 1960s. Why then? In part, it's because of it. In part, it's because, uh, you know, of, uh, I think the vision of that particular Supreme Court, but it's especially a vision driven by a particular justice, Justice Hugo Black who was the main force behind incorporation. He went back, studied the 14th Amendment, studied its history, studied its key framers, like John Bingham, who's actually right behind me on my wall right here, the main framer of the 14th Amendment, and reinvigorated this idea that the 14th Amendment was in part about a vision of national freedom, which included the protection of key Bill of Rights protections against state abuses, things like the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel. And so finally in Gideon versus Wainwright, we would have that, 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 that particular right incorporated. And the incorporation revolution continues all the way up until today. Just a couple of years ago, we incorporated the Eighth Amendment's ban on excessive, excessive fines. And so the, the incorporation process continues. Um, I don't want to miss um, a couple more uh, suggestions for 28th. Betty, you had a great um, one about governing bodies must reflect the community that they govern. So 51% women, 12% Black people. Like, so uh, that, that's a really interesting one. Um, and then let's see, we have um, one more question that could you clarify for Barbara, why the ERA had a time limit if the 27th Amendment didn't? Um, sure. I so it really is just a matter of uh, how the proposal was crafted. I forget when, it's somewhere in the early 20th century, I believe, where members of Congress start adding time limits onto amendments for ratification. So it becomes more of a norm as you get into the 20th century. It just, it wasn't there earlier. So it's a matter of how, the, how Congress decides to frame the proposed amendment. Um, and there's some debate, I think, as to the ERA, whether the time limit was just a resolution passed by Congress or whether it's really intertwined with the text of the amendment. But in the end, it, you know, the big debate is over whether or not the proposers can set that sort of time limit or not. It's just as a matter of congressional proposal, congressional craft, those proposals began to have time limits in the 20th century. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope, I think I got to all of the proposed amendments and most of the questions, um, but uh, thank you for joining us. And um, if you have any other questions, you can shoot us an email, but um, we are at our time. So have a great day, everybody.